Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, session uh, today. Uh, again, uh, this is a part of uh, annual uh, academic conference uh, organized by Korean Association of International Studies. Uh, especially today's panel is also sponsored by Korea Foundation. And we have a very uh, uh, interesting uh, and important topic to talk about today with excellent uh, uh, three uh, presenters and also three discussions. Um, I'm Song Ho Shin, uh, a professor at the Seoul National University, uh, Graduate School of International Studies, uh, today's moderator. And we have uh, uh, three uh, presenters. First, uh, from Korea, uh, Professor Kim Jun Young uh, from Handong Global University, who will talk about the Korean Peninsula at the forefront of uh, shifting geopolitical tectonic plate in Northeast Asia. And second, we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Wang Yong from Peking University, uh, who will talk about the securitization of economic interdependence. And last uh, but not the least, uh, uh, Professor Nishino Junya from Keio University of Japan, uh, who will talk about global change and uh, potential for Japan-Korea cooperation. And uh, as you already know, uh, this is uh, again uh, 70th uh, anniversary of Korean War Armistice, and at the same time also alliance, and uh, there are. Uh, Lots of things happening and changes, and especially in the middle of this uh, uh, geopolitical uh, dynamics in various parts in Europe and Asia. And uh, in this time, I'm really happy to have uh, three uh, great experts and uh, scholars representing three countries, uh, Korea, China, Japan, uh, today. And we have also uh, three excellent discussants, uh, Professor Kim Tae-hung from Sungshil University and Professor Bae young ja uh, from Gongguk University. And then uh, Dr. Cho Eun-il uh, from the Korea Institute for Defense Analysis. So without further ado, today's uh, presentation will uh, you know, go on. Uh, each presenter will have about 15 minutes I will set up the alarm clock, so don't be <laughs> alarmed or <laughs> surprised when there is some beeping sound. That's just a kind of notice for you that time's up, but that doesn't mean that you know, there will be penalty or anything. <laughs> and then for each uh, discussant, uh, about uh, seven minutes. Okay, so uh, first, uh, uh, let me invite uh, Professor Kim Jun Young for his presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Shin. Uh, my name is Junyoung Kim. I'm from Internet School of International Studies at Handong Global University. And I'm really honored and happy to be invited in this very important and precious session. But you know, for the past over one year, actually almost, I almost when I was invited, I was surprised because I was almost the outcast for the past one <laughs> and more year. Uh, by uh, any government sponsored or organized panel. Maybe it's a mistake by KF, but mm. thank you very much. I believe, I prefer uh, as a generosity to mistake. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually had a little bit grandiose uh, kind of uh, title. Uh, the Korean Peninsula at the forefront of the shifting geopolitical tectonic plates in uh, Northeast Asia. Uh, in 15 minutes, I cannot explain all, but one key thing is I believe is volatility. The level of volatility is much higher than ever before uh, in this Northeast Asia as well as the whole world. You know, we, are, we all know that there is ongoing debate on how to define this uh, change world changing world order, and many people, you know, already say it's a new Cold War. But I am not the fan of uh, the fixed 
order of new Cold War. You know, definitely post-Cold War uh, order is over, almost over, but not disappeared. Post-Cold War was characterized by neoliberalism, like free trade, global governance, international organization. These are uh, dwindling. But whether it is new Cold War, I don't agree with that, not yet fixed. But almost become a fad, catchword, already used frequently by politicians and media. You know, there are two, I think, order is clashing each other. One is, of course, no globalization still remains, even though it's dwindling. And but the other phenomena, f including fragmentations, uh, exclusive nationalism, sometimes hostile nationalism, and geopolitics uh, rising up. It's a mixed, still either of one, neither of one is dominant. But it's a mixed, but the, the new phenomenon is more conspicuous. So it is more like fragmented and nationalistic and geopolitical. Uh, one big uh, characteristic of this kind is, is a messy. It's not really neat and consistent. It's very random. Uh, we have to uh, concentrate and focus on this. Uh, we so-called liberal international order or rule-based international order, you know, value-oriented foreign policy in crisis, even though Western world, including U.S., uh, argue or are, uh, as a, use as a flagship uh, defending against Russia and China and other so-called evil countries. You know, democracy, I think there were, there have been three mainstays of liberal international order. It's democracy and free trade and Pax Americana. All three mainstays are weakening or faltering. Democracy is faltering you know, by ultra-rightist nationalism. You know, um, so many countries have uh, free elections, but after the elections, it's almost like a patronized to become authoritarian and ignore Congress and people. And second, free trade and capitalism, income inequality is prevalent in all countries. And third one is, you know, uh, Pax Americana is weakening, especially by U.S.-China strategic uh, competitions. So, two key words that explain, describe very well about this changing world order. Uh, the era of a new normal and era of post-truth. New normal is transition period. It looks like a transitional, looks like abnormal, but becoming almost like normal. That means enduring this uh, viability of this abnormality. It characterized by the uncertainty and instability and inequality. And second key word is called post-truth. So position, political position is more important than the truth. So truth is not working anymore. And fake is more powerful than the fact. So it actually, uh, dictionary company, Oxford Dictionary, Encyclopedia picked this word in, in 2016 when uh, Great Britain declared the Brexit and the when uh, Donald Trump became president. It's not really uh, uh, coincidence. It is really a, a uh, connected each other very deeply. So Trump was not the outlier. He was a rather a byproduct, more so than more so a catalyst of the trend actually sweeping the U.S. and the world. Um, he argued, and actually Biden, President Biden argued that he tried to break of this trend, but he became follower of the trend. 
U.S.-China strategic competition is at the core of this changing world order. It's a three, it has a three uh, aspect. Number one is a structural pro problem brought by a power shift of the international politics. Second, domestic politics, especially these days, foreign policy was dominated by domestic political cost. So more than 80% of Americans have negative feelings about China. So that, that means any politician in America cannot ignore the political asset criticizing China. Three, U.S. foreign policy decision makers has becoming strategically paranoid. You know, is China sometimes in genuinely be, can become a threat, but U.S. decision makers, foreign policy decision makers, exaggerate threat of China. Okay. The, uh, the number of U.S. allies and partners combined is about 60 countries. And the number of countries having China as number one trade partner reaches 120, almost twice as much, even though it's a different standard. But more important than this is many of these countries are overlapped. The problem is East Asia. East Asia geopolitically more grim than any other uh, area, especially even though, as I said, no new, it's not a new Cold War, but at least East Asia become the forefront of uh, Cold, new Cold War, at least promoted by U.S. leaders. And as the fourth line of U.S.-China competition has been created along the Korean Peninsula. As you can see the map, uh, along the Korean Peninsula, East Asia, East China Sea, and Taiwan Strait, and the South China Sea. This become physical front line of the U.S.-China strategic competition. Uh, other area has still room for maneuvering, but somehow around the Korean Peninsula, East, uh, Northeast Asia, and East Asia, this forefront becoming a hotspot for the uh, U.S.-China strategic competitions. Actually, uh, previous government, Moon Jae-in governments noticed that try to uh, become a linker or a bridge between these two powers. But this government actually last November is Phnom Penh statement, a joint statement, US, Korea, and Japan. And you government, Yun government, decided to join an American-led anti-China coalition. Which means, you know, in the Indo-Pacific Indo Indo uh, strategy, it is actually there is no room for continental country, even though South Korea, Korea is continental state also. But Yun government decided to join the maritime countries, especially with U.S. and Japan. Shaping up anti-China bloc situations is a bad idea. Even if U.S.-China relations remain perilous on geopolitical, geoeconomic, technological, and ideological spheres, it should not be described as new Cold War, as I said, since China remains interdependent with the outside world and participates in numerous international institutions. Some say that the ROK should re uh, revisit how Joseon dynasty, the last dynasty of Korea, responded to the historical transition between Ming and Qing, dynasty of China. This advice is flawed in many aspects. The US cannot be like Ming, and it will be difficult for China to be like Qing. But one clear lesson to take from Joseon's experience is that putting everything in one basket comes with a terrible cost. Our alliance with the U.S. is vital to securing our future. 
as China's rise might pose a, us a threat. However, we should firmly resist to any action by the U.S. that could drag us into a new Cold War. Global governance based on liberal international order no more rely on the U.S. and China for leadership. Both currently promote alternatives for the international order. The times of U.S. benign leadership in the liber, uh, liberal international order is likely to be almost over. Given America's domestic issues agenda, China has no choice but pretending to support liberal international for its survival. It's very ironic for, for China to react against the U.S. pressure, they promote somehow free trade and liberal international order, genuine multilateralism. It is unable to put this money where its mouth is, though although a multilateralism for assuaging potential conflict in East Asia long been considered a right path. Multilateralism is waning in the region. Nevertheless, being unable to rely on leadership of any single power, collective leadership based on multilateralism will have to be reinvigorated, especially by concerted efforts by capable country, especially I call it second row countries, you know, except these two superpowers, Korea, Japan, uh, France, Germany, Canada, and Australia, and so on. We should work together to convince Washington to reform the rules of a multilateralism and call on Beijing to live up to its claim of a peaceful rise. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <coughs> very in, in time, but uh, at the same time, lots of uh, interesting uh, point, so maybe to discuss later on. So next uh, would be uh, Professor Wang Yong from Beijing University, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy uh, to attend uh, this very important conference uh, hosted by KAIS. Uh, good uh, topic and good timing to make uh, reflections on the lessons of the, the Korean War and uh, the Amsterdam Agreement. So we are at uh, another a uh, 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 crossing road. Uh, we talk the very important lessons we should not return uh, to the Cold War. Now we have seen uh, many people uh, start to talk about the new Cold War of the Cold War II. Right? So then I think there will be very bad So if such kind of scenario is come to choose uh, to our region the East Asia or Asia, the Pacific. Uh, everybody uh, will suffer, will be the losers. Uh, today, uh, my topic is about the securitizations of economic interdependence, the China-US strategic competitions, and China uh, responses. Uh, some of them uh, might echo to Professor De Kim's uh, uh, previous uh, presentations. Uh, I share uh, some concerns okay, of him. I'm teaching at Peking University uh, the, uh, the subject of international political economy, uh, US-China relations, uh, trade uh, politics. Okay, that's my main uh, focus. We have seen, uh, you know, that is very unfortunately Right, so very different from the last three decades. Right, the way we are moving a, a new era of international relations uh, characterized with the securitization of interdependence. Economic interdependence uh, has been the very important the consequences of the last three decades uh, development of economic globalizations now we see the rising uh, trend of geopo uh, geopolitical uh, rivalry 
uh, so-called major power strip competitions, now they change, uh, turn the tide. Right? So I think uh, the uh, securitizations of the global supply chain and the interdependence uh, has become a very important topic. That can be a good, uh, of good opportunities for IR scholarship, but I think it will be very bad uh, for the world. So the U.S. now, we say, as uh, U.S. is the, the leading uh, force, uh, you know, we uh, uh, reorient uh, the development of the global uh, uh, economic globalizations, uh, including the redefinition uh, U.S.-China uh, relations, uh, target China as the biggest security threat. That is uh, uh, potential to the uh, to overthrow uh, U.S. the power status uh, since uh, you know has, uh, U.S. has been uh, you know the gained uh, since the end of the Cold War. Now, what about the uh, the U.S. policy of the last uh, the, uh, the, the the recent uh, two administrations, the Trump administration's uh, China policies? I think the mainly uh, to take advantage of the uh, pandemic, uh, carry forward a substantial uh, decoupling with China, and more important, uh, to implement a new Cold War uh, strategies. Right, so that is partially uh, since uh, the, uh, the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the Trump administration has uh, grasped the opportunities uh, to carry forward economic uh, decoupling, uh, mainly uh, carry forward the two uh, important uh, policy or strategies. Now, one is uh, a partnership for economic prosperity, that is try to uh, reduce uh, the manufacturers uh, in China, uh, get rid of the uh, 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 China uh, from the global supply uh, chains. Okay, that is uh, mainly that is uh, carried forward by the U.S. Uh, State uh, Department. So that is a starting point of so-called uh, nearing shoring or the friend shorings. Okay, that is accepted by the uh, Biden administrations. The second big uh, policy uh, is a clean network initiative. That's a try to, uh, so the kick off the Chinese, uh, the 5G technologies, equipments, uh, China internet companies, and APP, et cetera, okay, from the, uh, to pursue or uh, pursue aid or coerce uh, the, uh, the many countries. I think here, I think have the number, is a 43 countries okay, to participate in uh, this so-called the killing uh, and it's a network initiative. So the interesting to, uh, to know the how, uh, how the Biden administrations uh, uh, cope with the legacy of, uh, of the, uh, the Trump administrations, especially on its terrible war right, imposed by a previous government. Right? So very interesting to say. Even the U.S. business communities, uh, consumers associations, urge for the giving up of the extra the tariff imposed on the imports from China. The Biden administration, uh, in, uh, in the end, uh, made decisions uh, to uh, maintain uh, these uh, schemes of the tariff. Uh, even that is uh, the U.S. business communities and uh, the uh, analysts. They emphasized over 90% uh, of the tariff duties were banned on the shoulders of American companies and consumers. So that is, uh, you know, that is uh, most important things uh, in the, uh, Biden, uh, the uh, Biden administration's first, first national security strategy document. I think, uh, you know, when we see it, we will understand. Okay, China has picked up as the number one uh, security uh, threat. Okay, that means M2 uh, has the potentials increasingly uh, comprehensive to overthrow the U.S. Uh, predominant uh, status. And now, you know, you see, besides uh, the keeping uh, the uh, the extra uh, uh, duties on the imports of China, 
the item nutritions, uh, you know, you see uh, carries uh, out the technology uh, trade restrictions uh, based on policy of so-called small yacht and a high uh, fence. Okay, that is about uh, you know two thousand uh, Chinese entities has been put on the entity list about the June uh, twenty twenty-three. Right, so the, a part of uh, this uh, U.S. government on one hand is try to uh, reduce the dependence on the uh, made in China. Uh, you know, you see uh, the pro uh, the projects as mainly in the four uh, for the sectors. That's a larger capacity, uh, you know, is the, uh, the batteries, the electronic cars, uh, you know, is the rare earths, and the pharmaceuticals uh, in the names of promotions of, uh, you know, the supply chain resilience. Right? On the other hand, we will say they have to, uh, you know, see mainly uh, targeted uh, China's semiconductor industries uh, to deny uh, Chinese companies uh, access uh, to the high-end uh, chips and uh, related uh, technologies. Uh, interesting to say, yeah, so I we see have uh, the U.S. also, after these four, uh, uh, two uh, years, the Biden administration also uh, did some reflections on its China policy. Uh, you know, you see, uh, one is that uh, China, uh, the, the question, uh, has the U.S. lost uh, the trade war uh, against uh, China? So that is, we have seen that, okay, now uh, U.S., uh, the government has changed its tones, okay, from so-called uh, decoupling uh, in, of, away from China or to the de-riskings. We can see it uh, from the uh, senior officials of uh, Biden administration's uh, the, the speech. Right, so that is uh, uh, make some uh, shift of the policy. On uh, one hand, they will emphasize Okay, that is, uh, uh, you know, you have a uh, constructive uh, you know, economic relations with China, it crucial to the U.S. economy. Uh, but on the other hand, they are, uh, you know, driven by uh, national security concerns. They will continue to import uh, the, uh, the export uh, control, uh, the measures, uh, so they own in China. So the China response, okay, very uh, interesting to the uh, notice. Uh, China feels uh, uh, greater pressures. Uh, China's industries and sectors it suffers uh, okay, from that. Uh, but uh, China now uh, focus on okay, the several the things as a counter the measures. Okay, one is uh, to try to enhance the, the autonomy and the controllable capacities of industries and the supply chains. Right. So that means have to, uh, to the break, uh, China have to make achievements in so-called uh, throat chalk, uh, uh, throat uh, chalk uh, technologies. So for example, in the Huawei uh, technologies has made a lot of innovations uh, in the, um, uh, uh, so the, in the mobile, uh, in the mobile phone uh, operating uh, system, in the database, and the many others, right? So China used to be depend on the, uh, you know, the supply uh, from the United States. Now China is find it very crucial, uh, imperative, to replace the U.S. technology for the purpose of survival and security. Uh, secondly, uh, China carrying forward uh, dual circulations, a new development uh, strategy to drive the sustainable growth of China's economy uh, with uh, domestic uh, the market. But the most important thing is uh, China will, uh, decide, uh, you know, has uh, determined to uh, start up the further opening in terms of the rules, regulations, uh, managers, and standards, reducing the negative list of foreign investment market the access so China has set up 21 pilot free trade bonds and the Hainan free trade port to build a market-oriented rule of law based first class business environment. So that has been, uh, has been part of the countermeasures against the US decoupling uh, you know, the measures. 
Uh, no, not to mention, uh, China will uh, continue its efforts uh, with initiative uh, Belt Road Initiative, right, to expand the partnership and the corporations uh, with the countries that would like to work with China. So what about the future? Okay, the given the limit of uh, times, so I will be very short on this part. So we have a very, uh, you know, the unclear, uncertain uh, free, free future. So the who will win, as nobody know, right? So this is, uh, might be uh, the US at this moment. Now okay, that is on uh, one hand, they try to, uh, okay, try to they compete with uh, China, uh, okay, that is by making a uh, uh, security alliance. But on the other hand, they like to stabilize a relationship uh, with China. Uh, Professor De Kim has mentioned that. Uh, so that is a, a very important, uh, complicated uh, development. But I think that China is not the Soviet Union. Uh, I think the US might feel the more difficulties, uh, even the failure, to uh, implement a new Cold War on China. Okay, that will be that US strategy will be constrained by the many factors, including China has a large economic size, a more comprehensive economic strength, and China has been uh, uh, much more uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, integrated uh, into the global uh, economy. So the, all these things are well the limit, the U.S. constrictions on China. On the other hand, I will say uh, the U.S. may face a, a major uh, structure uh, deficiency uh, in its system and institutions uh, will be uh, funding, uh, eroding the foundations of U.S. power and capacity uh, in dealing with China. Uh, here I listed, that is, uh, the factors uh, leading to uh, is, uh, the uh, uh, social uh, sustainability uh, problems, uh, political sustainability uh, problems, especially uh, deepening political uh, polarizations. Uh, it may, uh, it, it's very difficult to make any meaningful reform because of the influence of infected uh, influence as well as economic sustainabilities, uh, foreign policy, uh, you know, sustainabilities, the overspending military, wider state oppositions against U.S. interventions, etc. Right. So I think that is China will uh, play uh, uh, in, in a better uh, skill way, the biggest card in hand. Okay, that is uh, Chinese markets. Uh, China will uh, in AC2, uh, to continue to play uh, with it's uh, some advantages uh, in its political uh, system, okay, the, including that economic resilience, uh, strong independence, and uh, the, uh, you know, can be uh, try uh, to uh, make it possible to turn the competition and crisis uh, into the opportunities uh, for development. I want to stop here. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, your comments are welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wang Yong, and uh, Professor Nishino from K University. Please. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very meaningful conference. I am Nishino from K University in Tokyo. I'd like to my thanks to uh, President Park Ini and uh, next President Ma San Yun of KAIS and all of KAIS people for inviting me to this conference. So the topic given to me is the global change and the potential for Japan ROK Corporation. So as we all know, the, thanks to the strong leadership of the President Yun so -gil, now uh, we've seen the rapid uh, restoration of uh, our bilateral uh, relationship between Tokyo and Seoul. The President Yun uh, Ever since the presidential election campaign, President Yun has stressed the need to rebuild the bilateral relationship, and he has acted decisively on that conviction, notwithstanding the strength of anti-Japanese sentiment in South Korea. His leadership on, the, on this bilateral relationship should be highly appreciated. The Prime Minister Kishida has responded to President Yoon's effort to mend ties with Japan by his early visit to South Korea uh, in May 7th, 
just、uh, two months after President Yu's visit to Japan. When、uh, Prime Minister Kishida talked about Japan ROK relationship, he、uh, repeatedly mentioned like this. Amid the current global situation in which the rule based international order is threatened, there has never been a time when Japan ROK strategic cooperation and Japan US ROK strategic cooperation have been needed more, and there is no time to waste in improving Japan ROK relations. So, as Prime Minister Kishida stated, The rule based international order faces a crisis due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's attempt to change the status quo by force. So, the cooperation between Japan and ROK is indeed, to, indeed an essential requirement. So, Japan and South Korea,、uh, the two neighboring countries, share the values of liberal democracy. And both are a l l i e s of the United States. And Japan is third, and the、uh, ROK is the tenth largest economy in the world. So、uh, I think the,、uh, we, Japan and ROK,、uh, should be the national partner,、uh, not only in the region, but also in the global arena. But、uh, when we talk about、uh, the progress of Japan and ROK、uh, relation and cooperation, Uh, there are some uh, challenges uh, uh, moving ahead in bi our bilateral ties. I would like to point three things. First one is the、uh, domestic politics, especially、uh, national sentiment in both nations. And second is the, the bilateral cooperation, especially in the security field. And third one is the、uh, cooperation on the Indo Pacific region. So, regarding the first uh, point uh, on the、uh, national sentiment in, in both uh, nations, uh, as I mentioned, the, the bilateral,、uh, when we talk about bilateral、uh, relationship between the Tokyo and the Seoul,、uh, now the、uh, current international situation,、uh, like、uh, Ukrainian situation and uh, uh, Chinese、uh, assertiveness in this region,、uh, acting as a kind of driving force to encourage cooperation between the two countries. But at the same time, the、uh, national sentiment in both nations, especially in South Korea's, uh, South Korea's uh, complex uh, national sentiment,、uh, remains a limiting factor、uh, in improving、uh, bilateral ties. So, there are still a strong public op opposition to Yun's Japan policy, particularly his plan to break the impasse over the compensation of Korean workers during the wartime for Japanese companies. The further minefields await the two leaders, including the release of treated water from the disabled Fukushima nuclear power plant. And Korea's opposition to the addition of the Sado Mine Complex to the UNESCO World Heritage List. So, Japan and ROK government、uh, will need to navigate such、uh, issues carefully in order to keep bilateral friction under control. The second point is on the、uh, cooperation、uh, between Tokyo and Seoul, especially、uh, in the security field. So, with the restart of satellite diplomacy between the Japan and ROK,、uh, now、uh, we have an opportunity to escape the vicious circle whereby historical dispute undermined all aspects of the bilateral relationship, including trade, security cooperation, and the people to people exchange. So, in the economic sphere, Japan moved, the end, Japan moved to end the economic.、Uh, A curve、uh, on, imposed on South Korea. And in the security field arena, President Yoon pressed to completely normalize Japan ROK,、uh, General Security of Military Information Agreement, or GSOMIA. The two leaders also agreed to resume the suspended Japan ROK security dialogue and vice ministerial level strategic dialogue. 
and also to establish consultation on economic security. And the trilateral cooperation among Japan, ROK, and the United States to counter the North Korea's military threat has, have, has also uh, reactivated. In the joint statement issued in a Phnom, Penh, uh, Phnom Penh, Hanoi, last October, uh, after the summit, trilateral summit meeting among the three countries, this uh, statement expressed their intent to share North Korean missile warning data in real time. So three countries have regularized ballistic missile search and tracking exercise and uh, anti-submarine joint uh, naval drill. So now we've seen the uh, rapid uh, recovery of our uh, trilateral security cooperation in the region. But I think the uh, current cooperation, trilateral cooperation, uh, put uh, more emphasis on defense and deterrent side. But uh, uh, hopefully, I think that uh, we need uh, more comprehensive uh, policy, especially toward North Korea, not only on defense and deterrent side, but also uh, preparation for the dialogue and diplomacy. So as, as, as some may know, uh, recently, Prime Minister Kishida uh, expressed his strong hope to uh, have a dialogue and a negotiation with North Korea. I think the, this is a kind of the North Korea's tactics, try to drive in a wedge among the three countries. So, uh, not to, so the, uh, now we are ready to, uh, not to, uh, for North Korea not to exercise this kind of the tactics. Uh, we are ready to uh, more comprehensive e policy toward North Korea. The third point is on the e cooperation uh, in the Indo-Pacific in uh, area. So restart of shuttle, shuttle diplomacy and uh, mending tie between the Japan and South Korea also provide an opportunity for Japan and South Korea to, refer, to reaffirm the potential for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region and the wider international community. So Yoon so administration has embraced the diplomatic goal of turning South Korea into a global pivotal state through proactive contribution to the international community. In December last year, uh, he, President Jung, released a strategy for free, peaceful, and prosperous in the Pacific region, echoing Japan's free and open in the Pacific initiative. So Japan, Prime Minister Kishida, has also be cha been charting a new course on foreign policy and security. So Prime Minister Kishida uh, revised uh, Japan's national security strategy and the two other key defense uh, documents last year. And also, or past March, uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, traveled, when Prime Minister Kishida traveled to New Delhi, uh, he announced a new plan for a free and open in the Pacific. So this conference of the event uh, between two uh, countries has presented a rare opportunity for Japan and South Korea to, co to coordinate and cooperate on matters of regional strategy and policy. So their ability to capitalize on that opportunity could have important consequences for the future of our two countries and the entire Indo-Pacific region. So last year, when President Yoon so uh, visited Japan, uh, he visited Keio University, my university in Tokyo, and he addressed, uh, he, he spoke as follows uh, in front of the Japanese and the Korean students. So Korea and Japan, two close neighbors, are liberal democracies that share the foundation built on universal values such as freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. So this fact it's in itself holds a special meaning so this signifies that our two countries must assume our leadership roles together as we strive toward a common goal of peace and prosperity in the international community. 
through solidarity and cooperation. So I really hope that uh, these uh, two countries play this uh, role uh, by, by through, the, through, uh, through uh, gaining a strong support of two uh, nations. So I stop here and uh, looking forward to library, library discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> Professor Nishino. So we have uh, three discussants uh, who, who will discuss each of these uh, uh, three presentations. So first, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Kim Tae-young, who will uh, discuss this presentation uh, by uh, Professor Kim jun um, Thank you. Um, my name is Tae-young Kim uh, at Sungshil University. And first and foremost, uh, I'm, I'm very thankful uh, for being invited to this uh, prestigious uh, panel. Um, I'm going to uh, discuss about uh, Professor Kim jun Hyung's uh, excellent um, uh, presentation. Um, it's very um, uh, well-structured, and the, it covers all the important and significant elements of the current uh, international security environment. Um, so it's, um, I'm, I, I learned a lot. Um, and the first uh, the comment I'd like to make is that um, the current, the changing, uh, shifting international order, um, Professor Kim emphasized um, you know, fragmentation, nationalism, and geopolitics, and all those are, uh, are contributing to the worsening um, uh, overall security and uh, envir security environment in the world. Uh, certainly, the uh, world is in uh, great peril, um, the return of great power politics, uh, emerging non-traditional uh, security threats like a uh, pan uh, pandemic, cyber threats, climate change, and things like that, and also the decline of American leadership. Uh, so, as Professor Kim said, no more Pax Americana. So, certainly, US led liberal international order has been um, significantly weakened. Um, uh, but, uh, as Professor uh, Kim said, um, he's not a, a fan of the you know, term a new Cold War or the Cold War II. Uh, because it's not yet fixed, and uh, China is, is so interdependent um, uh, uh, to be considered like that. Uh, but uh, I think the Cold War reference is very, uh, still very important uh, when, making, uh, when thinking about uh, changing international order, uh, because the Cold War uh, provides uh, certain characteristics, especially the bipolarity uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union, and also the ide ideological competition, uh, strategic rivalry, et, et cetera. Uh, especially, the shifting global uh, balance of power uh, is so important uh, in, in when you think about um, the international order uh, change. Uh, so the Cold War, Cold War was certainly a bipolarity, um, and it's replaced by the US uh, unipolarity, uh, but uh, there has been uh, significant uh, debates about um, if from unipolarity, uh, is it changing? Or if, if there is a change, uh, from what to what? Um, is it going to be multipolarity, uh, bipolarity, or some fuzzy bifurcation, or what? So if there is an order, new order is emerging um, to replace the US-led liberal international order, uh, what is it? And who would lead it? And also, um, um, the, what, under the, the, this circumstance, uh, what would be uh, the, the what would be being followed uh, by this uh, change, uh, changing international order? So that would be my first question. Um, if international order is certainly changing, uh, from what to what, or um, what would be the new uh, international order to replace uh, the U.S.-led international order? Um, and the another thing is. The Professor Kim uh, seems to be very critical to the, the currently uh, going U.S., uh, Korea, Japan trilateral alliance um, uh, because one of the reasons is it excludes uh, continental Asian country, especially China, and he, uh, 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 he suggests uh, instead uh, the collective leadership-based uh, multilateralism, and that should be reinvigorated. Re reinvigorated. And also related with that, um, uh, in this increasing uh, U.S.-China competition and force for peace and security uh, in the region, he also suggests uh, Korea peace process uh, uh, is, should, should be the uh, best possible card. Um, I uh, agree with that, and, and those are all very desirable. Uh, but 
the, if we look at the current uh, situation uh, under the worsening uh, security um, uh, circumstances like a uh, uh, war um, in between uh, Russia and Ukraine uh, and worsening uh, U.S.-China rivalry and North Korea's nuclear threat uh, and maritime territorial dispute uh, in, the, in East Asia, uh, if it's really uh, happening, I mean, uh, if it's, de it's desirable, but uh, uh, could it really happen? If so, how? How we could promote uh, that kind of um, uh, collective leadership-based multilateral order or, or Korean uh, peace process? Um, that's uh, my second uh, question. And uh, Professor Kim emphasized the, the falling democracy a lot. Um, and I became very imp interested because uh, recently I worked on this subject as well. So currently, besides geopolit geopolitical tectonic shift, um, there has been a challenges and competition in values and ideologies, and the Biden adm administration is actively uh, promoting uh, the new security strategy uh, based on the division between democracy versus autocracy. Uh, but the uh, United States seems to be losing the edge because recent survey shows that uh, uh, democracy has been declining and the autocracy uh, has been uh, increasing. Um, and there, is, there are many reasons. Um, you know, in the, the recent uh, the autocratic leaders are not like former uh, dictators uh, who emphasized uh, fear, instilling fear among the people, um, and based on fear, they could rule uh, whatever they wanted. Uh, but the, the current uh, autocratic leaders, uh, they are in general, legally elected, but after they are elected, after they, they become leaders, um, they weaken uh, judicial uh, structure and demonizing and marginalizing opposition um, and disabling media's role as a critical base of democratic principles. So some people call it uh, spin dictators uh, rather than uh, fear dictators. So inclusiveness, uh, diversity, and civic nationalism, and democracy, uh, multilateral democracy has been um, replaced by exclusive uh, nativist nationalism and illiberal democracy. And uh, unfortunately, that's what's happening in the world, and that's the, those kind of authoritarian states have been, have been um, increasing uh, around the world. So this kind of tendency has been making vicious cycle, rise of authoritarianism, uh, nationalist competition rather than comp uh, cooperation, and unstable uh, international order. Uh, so what Professor uh, 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 Kim Jun-young uh, called it uh, something like uncertainty, inequality, and instability. Uh, and uh, in this environment, I think the center of concern should be the U.S. democracy's uh, robustness uh, that has been challenged. Um, the Professor Kim showed uh, the, 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 the slide of uh, uh, Trump and Biden uh, election results. Um, that looks very interesting. Um, uh, but as we know, um, the American democracy has been challenged, gravely challenged. Um, that led to uh, Trump's victory. And under Trump, um, all the criteria and standards of democracy significantly declined, like other uh, autocr autoc autocratic states. And even after the 2020 election, uh, he denied he lost. Um, and the election denier swept the rank of the Republican supporters, and conspiracy theories spread, and which culminated in January 6th insurrection. Uh, by storming the uh, U.S. Congress. And still majority of U.S. Uh, uh, the Republican supporters uh, believe that the election uh, was stolen. Uh, so there is a certainly an uh, injuring power of Trumpism. So even after the, all, these uh, all these legal troubles and indictments that uh, Trump has been going on uh, recently, uh, Trump is still the front runner of the Republic Republican Party. And according to the poll, He's very close to Biden as the next president of uh, the United States. So my final question is, um, you know, since the U.S. domestic politics, uh, U.S. democracy, this robustness is very important for uh, not only for the United States, uh, American people, uh, but also the international security. Um, what if Trump wins again in 2024 election? Uh, what would be foreign policy of the United States like? And how would the international order change? Uh, we already experienced that, and um, that could happen again. Or that, or the worst thing could happen. So 
um, that, that that's impact, its impact on U.S.-China competition and the possibility of military conflict, conflict uh, with uh, between United States and China uh, and U.K.'s uh, I mean sorry North Korea's uh, nuclear problem uh, etc. So that's my third question: What if Trump wins again? Uh, what what kind what kind of impact that would on that would be on the uh, international security order? So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, Professor Bae Young Zhao will uh, discuss Professor Wang Yong's presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Wang, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I think you told us how the people in China view the recent uh, U.S. China conflict. Uh, it would have been nice to have a presenter from United States on this panel to hear American way of uh, thinking on U.S.-China conflict and the comment on Professor Wang's presentation. Instead, I would like to say a few brief comments from a perspective of a third party, not a distant third party, uh, borrowed from Professor Kim Jun Young's phrase, at the, located at the forefront of shifting geopolitical landscape. Okay, as uh, Professor Wang pointed out, the export regulation against uh, Chinese firms started under the Trump administration and they have expanded to other fields like uh, manpower regulation, investment regulation, and capital regulation. And it is true that the United States has led the U.S.-China conflict so far. The U.S. clearly see China as a strategic competitor and a threat uh, in its national security uh, strategy document. But if we think about why, why the United States came to see China as a threat, we could uh, mention a general and specific uh, factors. At the general level, as Professor Graham Allison argued in his famous book uh, on Thukydides' trip, uh, it seems that the United States, the ruling party, ruling power, has begun to have fears about the speed of economic growth and strong potential of China, a rising power. It is apparent that the rise of China would uh, change the distribution of power in international politics, uh, it must be considered as a threat to the security of the United States. But at the specific case of U.S.-China rivalry, I would uh, like to mention, especially from the technology viewpoint, that the gap and the different views around the Chinese way of technology innovation are critical. In most of the countries, uh, technological innovation has been accumulated for a long time. During the process of technology innovation, they experience not only several breakthroughs and successful cases, but also many failures and difficulties in the midst of long-term continuous R&D investment. Many scholars have argued that the imitation and import technology, and purchased, purchased technology from developed country, and even illegally exploited technology without uh, paying a fair price, rather than self-oriented, self-generated, uh, and domestic uh, technology innovation have contributed to Chinese economic growth so far. Of course, uh, China is not an exception. We all know that there are many cases where economic growth and technology innovation uh, is made based upon uh, foreign technology acquired legally or sometimes illegally in most countries. But I think the reason why more attention and discomfort have been uh, made to the case of China is its enormous scope and amazing speed. I think the recent U.S. Uh, regulation raised a great challenge for China to rebuild as a more innovative countries, 
through internal accumulation of innovation capacity. I think it sends a message for China to change the direction and the way of Chinese technological innovation. Personally, I think the time might be favorable to China, I mean, uh, to be a genuinely innovative country, considering its huge capital, manpower, and government support. I think it's time for China to start accumulating technology innovation co capabilities through continuous R&D investment and innovation, experiencing numerous failures and difficulties. I believe that China's shift to, to strengthening domestic technological innovation is a proper strategy, and it would be better than you know, wasting time and energy on the blame game uh, with the United States. Of course, it is important that in this process, universal norms for technological innovations like intellectual property right must be observed, and this would contribute the change, the perception of China as an, a real, real genuinely, uh, genuinely innovative country. Secondly, uh, Professor Wang said the United States is losing uh, the recent trade and technology war. It is true that in the U.S. we could see the inflation partly due to the tariffs and you know, quantitative easing and many economic difficulties with U.S. company whose major market has been uh, China. Analysts say that uh, the speed of China Chinese technology development is slowing down, and Chinese economy is not recovering as quickly as expected. Uh, I think this uh, implies that this is a typically negative sum game where not only the United States is losing, but also China and the other countries are simultaneously losing due to the you know, accelerating U.S.-China trade and uh, partial adjustment in supply chain uh, uh, issues. So many see the rivalry between U.S. and China as a structural change, not a fad, tem uh, temporary phenomena. So it would not disappear easily. In this situation, it is necessary for U.S. and China should make an effort to manage instability and minimize the effect, negative effect of confrontation in the global political and economic order. Lastly, I would like to mention uh, Korea's position uh, amidst the technological conflict between U.S. and China. Until now, Korea's technological development, including semiconductor, could not develop without the cooperation, the help with uh, cooperation with uh, the United States. For example, in the semiconductor industry, the U.S. is supplying basic technology and major equipment, so the cooperation with the uh, United States is critical. However, Choosing to cooperate with U.S. firms does not mean that we could not cooperate with China anymore. Obviously, China has been a major export market for Korean, many Korean products like semiconductors. And the continuing growth of a Korean industry uh, would be difficult without cooperation with China. In other words, Korea wants to cooperate flexibly with the United States and China according to our national interest. Recently, cost and instability in the world economy are increasing due to U.S.-China competition and partial decoupling supply chain adjustment. All these are putting a heavy burden on Korea's technology innovation and economic growth. South Korea wants to contribute, build a dynamic global innovation system where each country tries to strengthen, strengthen its innovation capability 
cooperating and competing with each other, respecting the universal rules. Strategic decoupling seems to be unavoidable in some sectors, but other than that, all countries could benefit uh, from economic interdependence. So Korea wants US and China to talk and negotiate and stabilize international order. We Koreans also would expand our diplomatic radius through middle power, diplomacy, middle power diplomacy, deepening the cooperation with not only Japan, but also the US member, EU members like Germany, France, and Singapore and Australia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, last uh, but not, not the least again, uh, Dr. Cho uh, Unil and uh, Professor Anishinu's uh, presentation, please. Uh, thank you. My name is Unil Cho. I'm from uh, I'm uh, associate research fellow at the Korea Institute for uh, Defense Analysis and. I'm very thank you for both uh, KAIS and Korea Foundation to hold a venue uh, to discuss about regional order uh, with both Japanese and Chinese scholars in one table. And I'm very much pleased to uh, participate uh, in this session as a discussant. And as uh, Professor Sin uh, pointed that my comments uh, mainly goes to Professor uh, Nishino's uh, presentation. Yes, uh, Professor Nishino uh, well summarized uh, the recent uh, relations uh, between the South Korea and Japan. Uh, we've been uh, watched uh, Yoon, uh, President Yoon and uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida's uh, summit to restore a decade of uh, diplomatic uh, disarray uh, between two countries. And uh, the Yoon administration uh, from the yeah, his inauguration uh, pushed uh, a kind of future-oriented uh, Japan policy, and that is the big change from the previous government. And I think that uh, concluded as a result of the shadow diplomacy uh, between South Korea and Japan. Uh, it is uh, the leadership level communication, uh, so very uh, meaningful uh, to improve uh, the both relations in the further uh, uh, cooperation. And Professor Nishino uh, raised uh, three questions, uh, three points uh, in his analysis about the current uh, South Korea and Japan relations. First one is national sentiment, and the second one is bilateral security cooperation. And the third one is in the Pacific cooperation between South Korea and Japan. And my, I have three comments and related uh, questions regarding uh, his three points. Uh, yes, first, uh, the looking at the process of the current uh, South Korea and Japan relations, uh, it seems that the relationship has been restored uh, in which uh, South Korea take action first and uh, Japan accept it rather than Japan's action. So, of course, it is good uh, to have either side to move first and uh, have uh, initiative to improve uh, the relationship but it seems to be one-sided, not the mutual kind of cooperative way. So the, first exam uh, the, the example is, as Professor uh, Kim Jin-young pointed, the South Korea's unilateral uh, solution uh, for wartime labor, uh, uh, wartime forced labor issue. So that, that is why I think that the public opinion in South Korea is still cautious uh, about the future-oriented uh, South Korea-Japan relations. So I wonder uh, how Japanese domestic politics opinion uh, evaluate this kind of improvements in the current South Korean-Japan relations. And the second, uh, I'm very much curious about Japan's kind of perspective on South Korea's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, Professor Nishino uh, briefly touched upon the issue uh, in his presentation. So the UN administration uh, announced its uh, version of uh, in the Pacific strategy uh, in December 2022. Uh, but in fact, uh, even looking at Australia, uh, India, and even ASEAN, uh, as well as Japan, uh, it seems uh, quite late uh, for us to announce uh, our version of Indo-Pacific strategy at this point. 
So until now, Japan has actively carried out uh, quad cooperation, uh, various trilateral uh, cooperation uh, based on US-Japan alliance, and ASEAN cooperation, and even cooperation with uh, Pacific Islands uh, under the name of the Free and Open in the Pacific Strategy, that is FOIP. So in this sense, uh, South Korea can be seen as a country that is far behind in the field of Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. So if Japan considers uh, cooperation uh, with, uh, with South Korea uh, under the Indo-Pacific strategy, so how do you think about what kind of cooperation can be possible uh, between, the two, uh, between South Korea and Japan in the Indo-Pacific region? And my third point is uh, global change. Uh, actually, it is on your uh, title of the, uh, this uh, presentation, so I have to ask the questions about the global change. And I came up with uh, two uh, events uh, to characterize the recent global change. First one is COVID-19, and the second one is Russia-Ukraine war. And yes, we've been through uh, COVID-19 for two and three years, and the COVID-19 has been overcame by raising uh, our national barriers and the cutting of exchanges uh, with each other. So that means COVID-19 did not make any opportunity uh, to improve uh, the relationship between South Korea and Japan. Then how about Russia and Ukraine war? So yes, uh, when the Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, the whole world was very shocked and at the same time, uh, South Korean uh, diplomacy, uh, South Korea and the Japan seems to have uh, very different responses to Russia and Ukraine war. Uh, I think while South Korea kept an eye on uh, the situation while considering its relationship with Russia, uh, Japan uh, as a G7 country uh, condemned Russia's invasion quite strongly with uh, the economic sanctions, uh, not only unilaterally, but also the, uh, the multilaterally uh, under the name of the G7 country. So uh, in, in this sense, uh, in the wake of Russia and Ukraine war, the Japan emphasized not the kind of Indo-Pacific identity, but the identity of the G7 uh, in the world stage. And it was uh, very successfully hold the Hiroshima summit uh, this time uh, in Japan. So from these differences, uh, my perspective may, may seem quite skeptical uh, to evaluate that the global changes have provided any opportunity uh, to improve South Korean Japan relations. So it would be very nice to hear the uh, Professor Nishino's opinion on the evaluation. Thank you. Thank you very much. All uh, excellent three uh, discussions and comment and question. So now I would like to turn this table to again to the presenters to respond to each of these uh, comment or question from the discussion. So first, uh, Professor Kim Jun Young. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tin. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kim's uh, comment. It's very pinpointing and important, uh, raised important issues. I have a uh, three. Oh, plus one questions. The first one is yes. I, uh, still, Cold War is important. It's a key word to understand this changing world, especially two superpowers dominating. I think it's for for the next thirty, at least thirty years. It's the biggest in, uh, independent variable of international politics, definitely the U.S. and China. In that sense, bipolarity is the key word. But <clears throat> the word, the the reason why I kind of against the, the you know, fixed order of new Cold War because it definitely is different from the original Cold War. We cannot divide it into two, and it's not completely uh, separable. It's the, almost the interconnected, and I call it almost like addictions. The yeah, world is addicted to China, actually, and China is addicted to world, in that sense. And, and another point is, uh, Bipolarity, even though two powers are you know uh, exceeding uh, power over other countries, but 
other factors, other stakeholders are coming up too. Economically, BRICS and Global South becoming important. And Russia is crying out they are the one of the important players. So if we call it by, by the standard of polarity, I think it's bimultipolarity. I don't think it's dominant to a bipolarity in that sense. And from what order to what order, I don't know. That's, the, that's why I call it messy, because it's uh, mixed and confusing. That's why we call it new normal, because you know, next alternative or next order is not in the sight. So that's why it's this uh, uh, endured and, and the delayed coming of the next order. So at least uh, for the, you know, the next another 30 years. Uh, Second, I'm, yes, I'm critical of the uh, trilateral alliance movement, even though they yet to call alliance, but definitely more than just co military cooperation. In a previous government, Moon government defined that or tried to pursue a Korea-Japan relationship and limited it like, like this. Uh, yes, we need cooperate with Japan on specific issues, such as North Korean issue, nuclear issue, uh, you know, natural disasters, anti-piracy, is okay, but not alliance. We are not mature enough to become alliance, because alliance means no limit. So that's why I am critical about yet. And another reason is the geopolitical situations. If we joined this trilateral, geopolitically, we are forefront against you know, continental countries. So as that's what's happening. I think we are really be careful about calling this trilateral alliance need necessary because of China, Russia, North Korea. I don't think it's independent variables northern northern country. They're not that cohesive among. Korea, US, Japan is much more cohesive and become independent variable to cause Northern Triangle. And I think bad word, and actually trap for the progressive governments in the past was the word the balance. That's a, that's a big trap, actually self-made trap to be framed as pro-China, pro-Russia, or pro-North. In Korea, for the past 70 years, even progressive can, government cannot survive with this balance between China and Japan, uh, US. That's a myth. No progressive government pursues balance. Definitely, you know, US-Korea ROK alliance is an epicenter and the most important. But progressive government wants to say some autonomous autonomy, a little bit to some extent. But that balance is, is a, such a distorted and the wrong uh, word to use. Three, yeah, I totally agree with this democracy issues with Professor uh, uh, Kim. The problem is uh, cynicism. Actually, actually, Trump used this cynicism. Trumpism is all about cynicism, about politics. You know, the populism, either security populism or economic populism, they are not pursuing to solve the domestic issues, but blaming on others. And these days, national, exclusive nationalism is, is mostly used by these autocratic countries. That's why you know, this, it is authoritarian countries are blaming others, you know, other countries uh, for their domestic issues. That's why I called it the domestic audience costing is a soaring. So foreign policy is really in danger. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, uh, Professor Wang Yu, your response. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, Professor Bai uh, for your comments, uh, which is very uh, valuable. Uh, you uh, touch uh, several questions and make comments on that. I'd be happy to uh, make my own uh, as a feedback uh, to share my thoughts so on it. Uh, one is uh, that is uh, a great power, uh, the competition. Okay, I think that is uh, uh, 
uh, at this moment, okay, the United States, uh, in order to maintain its, uh, in its, uh, in its predominant power, uh, maintain the unilateral uh, order, right? Uh, try to, uh, you know, see, uh, deal with the competitors. Uh, either that is the uh, uh, Soviet Union in 1950s, 70s, uh, Japan uh, in 1980s, now China. Right? So I think that is, I think there's something wrong, uh, you know, with such a strategy. Even that the U.S. has power, has the power to uh, implement uh, such a strategy, so the, in the names of uh, national securities, and to promote uh, great power uh, rivalry. Uh, number one is we are in the uh, nuclear uh, you know, the age, right? So the nuclear powers compete, right? So it can be uh, imposed uh, uh, extra, extraordinary dangerous uh, to the world. Secondly, uh, to uh, the, uh, so undermine the economic uh, interdependence, right? To re, uh, uh, reordering uh, the uh, world, uh, world economy will slow down the economic uh, efficiency. Uh, everyone will suffer. So now we have seen it, we have seen the results uh, so they from that. Right? So we need to find a new ways to settle uh, the problems uh, with uh, competition. So I think that in, uh, in the uh, 21st centuries, we should get rid of this uh, great power uh, new competition mentality uh, in China, uh, in some other countries. Uh, we call it the Cold War mentality. So that is very important. We, we need uh, you know, I think to renew our mindset about international politics. Okay, that is, we should ensure that no longer, uh, no longer as uh, the zero sum game. Uh, secondly, uh, you uh, talk, uh, you discuss about the innovation and its influence on the future of U.S.-China uh, competition. I think that right. Okay, I share the ideas. The innovation uh, okay, will be the base. Uh, okay, will be very important factors to decide U.S. Uh, China, uh, U.S. China uh, competition, uh, so the results. But I'm not sure, you know, see, uh, what uh, you are, you know, see, your comments are, are really the main, right? So that is, of course, uh, China is uh, still uh, on the way of improving uh, in institution ability uh, of innovations. But I think one thing is clear, right? So China uh, can well be open to this, right? Uh, you know, even the U.S. tried to de close the doors uh, uh, technologies, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the transfers, but uh, China, I think, the, uh, you, know, you know, the try to ensure uh, the uh, the other opportunities of international corporations on uh, technologies, right? So the Europe and uh, the some other countries uh, okay, will be important on this. Uh, but I, as you point out that okay, China will be uh, have its innovations uh, based on its own. Uh, you know, the efforts, that's very important. Now we see the uh, uh, more, uh, more the achievements, right, from the uh, Huawei technology and many others, right? So that is something under the new context of international competition. China have to rely upon its own. That can be a good opportunities uh, for Chinese companies uh, and the industries, uh, to, uh, you know, so the, in, uh, the innovations. Uh, third, uh, third, third uh, the questions you mentioned, okay, has the U.S. Uh, lost uh, the trade war? Yeah, I think that is a uh, uh, question. Okay, that will depend on uh, your uh, perspective and the standard. Right, so the, in the last, uh, I think very interesting to notice uh, that, right, so the, in the last uh, two years, uh, 2021 and 2022, uh, U.S., China, you know, has uh, uh, you know, China trade uh, has reached the historical record uh, height. Uh, that's a very important thing. And on the other hand, uh, the, uh, the trade with the U.S. has uh, decreased its weight uh, in China's uh, total, uh, you know, the uh, you know, foreign trade. 
right? So they now the U.S. has become uh, second, uh, it become the third, uh, the largest trading partners to compare it. So and uh, China, uh, the EU trade has surpassed that of the uh, the U.S. and the EU uh, uh, the, the, the trade uh, trade relations. So that is more complicated. So the, above that, so I think that is. Uh, uh, I think uh, the China has become uh, the uh, largest trading partners, about 140 uh, in, uh, nations. Uh, China has replaced uh, okay, the U.S. positions uh, in the global supply chains right, in the last 20 years. So that it means okay, that China is no longer uh, only depends on the markets of the United States. Okay, China has expanded greatly the uh, trade uh, you know, relations with all the other regions, right? You know, the, uh, you know, the not limited to the uh, developed economies, uh, but also emerging economies, the developing, the developing countries. So I think that, that means a lot, okay, for uh, the, prospect, uh, the, the prospect of the U.S.-China uh, trade uh, competitions. Uh, the last Okay, you, uh, uh, you know, the comment on the role of Korea and Korea's proper role uh, in China-U.S. Uh, uh, relations. That's a very important point, uh, to share uh, your views, right? So I think we, our panel, I think that will be a very, uh, you know, we have heard uh, the important uh, the comments that. So I believe that, uh, you know, that is uh, uh, Korea you know, the, uh, in, a, uh, in a very good positions uh, to be bridging uh, the gap, promoting the understandings, uh, you know, between the U.S. and China. Okay, a peaceful, uh, stable U.S.-China relations uh, can serve all the interests of China. So this is my second visit after pandemic uh, to the other countries. Uh, in April, I uh, uh, so attended Chinese delegations to uh, visit Singapore. Okay, invited by the uh, Singaporean government. So that we have uh, conducted uh, China, uh, US, uh, Singapore uh, trilateral dialogue. Right? We met with uh, US delegations, uh, some of them right, separated by the pandemic. Okay, so, but I think the, we still share a lot of uh, you know, uh, you know, common views, right? even that is growing uh, tension. Right? So I think that is, we also engaged more uh, dialogues with the U.S. Uh, counterparts, uh, the think tanks like, uh, you know, the, we are, as in, uh, as in the early uh, uh, July, we will have a uh, dialogue with the U.S. again in U.S. China. We will visit uh, the U.S. So I think that is uh, countries like uh, Korea as a middle power uh, working with the other middle powers can play a very important but constructive role. Uh, to meditate uh, the confrontations, ensure so-called that is uh, over uh, symbolistic mentality of a great power uh, rivalry to bring the destability and the war to the world. So I think uh, there will be, uh, and uh, under there and that kind of policy will serve the interests of Korea and uh, the interests of a potential reunification of a Korea. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Nishino. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Cho, uh, for a uh, very uh, important and insightful comment and question. Regarding the first uh, point, uh, yes, uh, there is a uh, kind of the perception gap between the two countries on the pace and the way of the uh, restoration of the bilateral tie. Uh, uh, still, the uh, many South Koreans uh, uh, want Japan to show more sincere attitude, uh, especially uh, on the historical uh, issue. But uh, frankly speaking, uh, many Japanese and uh, Prime Minister, I think Prime Minister Kishida think that uh, yes, uh, we Japanese uh, show more sincere attitude, but uh, many Japanese, including I think Prime Minister Kishida, think that the sincere attitude uh, should be shown in the broader framework of the uh, restoration of bilateral tie. I mean that uh, uh, sincere attitude uh, in Korean uh, interpretation in the on the history issue, but uh, in Japanese interpretation, uh, sincere attitude is in the broader framework of the 
and the future-oriented bilateral uh, tie. So this is a kind of the perception gap on the, uh, regarding the sincere response or attitude. Uh, yes, uh, we needed to narrow this gap uh, by a frequent communication and a more or dialogue and more tangible uh, cooperation. Uh, so this is the, the first uh, answer of the first point that uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Che uh, uh, made. And the second point is the uh, possible uh, cooperation uh, arena and uh, agenda on, uh, on, uh, between the bilateral uh, relations regarding the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. Uh, the, I think that the possible, uh, I think the promising uh, area for cooperation is the kind of capacity building uh, in the ASEAN and the in Pacific Island countries. Uh, the, uh, actually, Japanese and the South Korean government, both government are already uh, doing this kind of the uh, uh, policy towards the ASEAN and the Pacific Island countries, but uh, uh, so far, uh, both government uh, exercise this kind of the e, e policy e respectively, not jointly. But uh, uh, thanks to uh, President Yoon's uh, expression of uh, his hope to uh, realize a uh, peaceful and uh, free e in the Pacific region, now uh, we both country uh, can jointly exercise uh, this kind of policy toward uh, ASEAN and uh, Pacific uh, Island countries. So I think this is a possible, uh, a promising area. And uh, I, I also think that uh, we can do another kind of cooperation. Uh, one is uh, uh, joint cooperation. Uh, another kind of cooperation is the uh, we e play our role. Uh, the respectively. So we need a kind of the uh, division of load and res responsibility. So for example, uh, on Taiwan issue, uh, if something happened on, uh, regarding the, on the Taiwan Strait, I think the Korea, uh, South Korea have to uh, de deter North Korea's uh, some uh, military uh, adventure, adventureness uh, regarding the Taiwan uh, Strait issue. But uh, uh, in, in case of Japan, uh, we, Japan we Japan needed to uh, as directly assist uh, US uh, forces in Japan to uh, deter uh, the aggression from the uh, third country to Taiwan. So we need this kind of the, the division of role and uh, uh, responsibility. This kind of the division of uh, role and responsibility uh, will contribute to the stability uh, in, in the region. And the uh, third point regarding the uh, how global change, uh, how much global change uh, gave uh, uh, impact to the, our uh, bilateral tie, uh, I think that uh, especially in South Korea, there is a growing a concern and uh, awareness on the uh, security importance of alliance and the importance of the kind of the uh, security more or defense and uh, uh, security uh, readiness towards the very severe uh, international uh, relations and order. So in this in this context, I think the. Uh, from for the Japan and South Korea, uh, this is a kind of opportunity to uh, rebuild and uh, reboost our bilateral and the trilateral cooperation. So we, uh, Japan and South Korea, are both uh, ally of the United States, and uh, we need jointly to address the, the first is North Korea nuclear nuclear threat, and second is a kind of economic coercion from the third third party. And uh, more broadly, uh, we needed to uh, sustain the global liberal international order. So in this context, the definitely, I think the uh, global change, especially the uh, war in Ukraine, uh, gave a kind of positive effect, positive impact to bilateral ties. But uh, uh, 
I would like to add one thing. Uh, as Professor Kim Jun Young uh, mentioned, uh, actually, uh, many Japanese also do not want to form a trilateral uh, alliance with United States and South Korea and Japan. Yes, uh, we Japanese also want to uh, cooperate in specific issues, North Korean issue and the various, uh, how can I say, the various uh, very uh, important issue in this region. Uh, since now, after the uh, deterioration of, of 10 years of our uh, very uh, devastated bilateral ties, uh, many Japanese, especially uh, security experts in Japan, are really cautious about the uh, deepening security cooperation uh, with South Korea. This is uh, actually the kind atmosphere in Japan. Uh, according to the opinion poll uh, recently, revealed by the Yobinu Shinbun and Hanguk uh, Ilbo, uh, the many uh, South Korean are really supportive on the trilateral security cooperation. Yes, uh, Japanese are relatively uh, supportive, but another opinion poll shows that uh, uh, relatively uh, Japanese less supportive than South Koreans in terms of the security, trilateral security cooperation among the three countries. So this is the kind uh, current situation in our uh, security cooperation and the perception. Thank you. Okay, I need to respond to that. Yeah, I believe you are saying that the Japanese does uh, you know don't want trilateral uh, uh, alliance. But there are two points I want to make. Number one is because the difference between the Yun and Moon government is unspecified. There is a possibility to expand this uh, military or security cooperation. That means, you know, the Moon government is specific issues. I do agree and I do support on specific issues, especially North Korean issues, but Yun government actually, no borderline, I don't think is any limitation. So, and another point is, uh, even though against, you know, the Japanese will, but United States want it, definitely, I believe, not all the United you know, American government wants to build up the trilateral alliance to defend or to block civilization of the East Asia. So uh, that part you have to uh, keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, we had a very good presentation and discussion so far. We still have some uh, few more minutes left. So uh, I'm wondering if there is any question from the floor. Audience? Yes, please. There will be microphones. So please briefly identify yourself. Oh. Hello, um, I'm Alan Machado from Sung Shin University, uh, pupil of Professor Kim, who I, have the, I had the opportunity to follow um, the foreign policy course that was really interesting. Uh, it was also really interesting to hear from each one of your point of view. So my question would be directed towards uh, the Korean audience and uh, the Mr. T uh, Nishino t uh, teacher from uh, Japan. Um, I would like to know if um, regarding the shift that you all see about the American leadership and the potential um, new multipolar era, do you feel any kind of feeling in local uh, and domestic opinion about eventually um, a feeling of a will of more in a more independence uh, in the policy of both South Korea and Japan um, regarding USA? Uh, to make it short, do you think that it's possible to have a shift from South Korea and Japan um, regarding their interests? Uh, to stay in connection, to stay in a peaceful relation with China, for example? And um, do you think that it's a possibility or the big game power is too strong and USA will keep the edge they had on, on Korea and, and Japan? So your, your question to both professor? Uh, yeah, to him and Mr. Mr. Nichino, which is the only Japanese teacher here, and one of the Korean teacher here, if you want to answer. 
Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think that uh, uh, at this point, the, uh, the situation in Japan and South Korea are quite similar, I think. The, yes, uh, we, uh, Japan and South Korea, are ally of the United States, but at the same time, uh, uh, China as a regional, uh, as a neighboring country, uh, we, Japan and South Korea, also try to uh, make a very constructive and stable relationship with China. Uh, so in this context, I think that uh, my personal opinion is that uh, Japan and South Korea um, ca can cooperate to mitigate, in a way, the kind of the U.S.-China uh, strategic competition in this region. Uh, so, so for, for example, on the summit meeting, uh, the May in Tokyo, uh, Prime Minister Kishida and uh, President Yoon agreed to accelerate the, the trilateral uh, high-level process among uh, Japan, South Korea, and China. And uh, now Japan and South Korea try to realize trilateral summit meeting uh, this year uh, in, in Seoul. So, so the, 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 the kind of this, this kind of the uh, effort uh, will be uh, jointly addressed by uh, Japan and South Korea. And uh, uh, Regarding the Professor Kim Jong Un's uh, the previous uh, comment, I totally agree that uh, yes, Biden administration, United States, really want to uh, how can I say uh, in integrate uh, our our security cooperation under the name of the integrated deterrence. But uh, uh, reality is that reality is that still uh, we Japan and South Korea have a very uh, different perception towards the China and as well as uh, uh, regional uh, affairs. So we needed to uh, narrow this kind of perception gap and uh, we needed to uh, have more uh, frequent dialogue. But uh, I think we, Japan and South Korea, uh, as a, a major power in this region, uh, should and can uh, take a lead in the regional cooperation in, in this region. This is my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before we wrap up, any final words from uh, Professor Wang or Professor Kim? Yes, I want to. Yeah, I want to. Very brief. Brief. Yeah. I think the, uh, for, for this region, uh, very important uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to learn from the histories. Right, so not uh, okay. All of us should be united uh, to avoid uh, the scenario of a new world, uh, a new Cold War. Secondly, we should learn from the uh, Ukraine uh, war. Uh, that's very important. So I think that is. Uh, it seems to me, uh, U.S. is a world the hegemon. You know, he has its strategy. You know, to maintain. Uh, you know, the, uh, the regional threat. Uh, to be united the all the other countries regions to realize its goals okay that's the nature of world power so i think that is to the regions uh, our regions very important to uh, to uh, important to make uh, our collective efforts <coughs> not uh, to euclidize uh, of the east asia okay they can be uh, in the taiwan uh, Korea uh, as in the peninsula and even Japan. They can be, uh, you know, be involved in the uh, so big, cover, uh, big power the conflict, right? So the, but the U.S. well, uh, stay behind, okay, as in the case of the Ukraine uh, conflict. So I think that is my, uh, now, uh, now a lot of people uh, start to talk about uh, Ukrainian of uh, Taiwan, uh, uh, Taiwan Ukrainian of East Asia. Thank you. No? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we really had a very great uh, panel today and discussion. Uh, excellent presentation by all those uh, three great experts and also wonderful comment and uh, question from the discussion. And uh, closing in, uh, personally, I think uh, this is a really, uh, I think it's been a long time that uh, we had this kind of international conference among uh, Korea, China, Japan together uh, since COVID. So this is, for me, it was very uh, refreshing uh, to meet and hear all these, uh, our fellow and uh, scholars from these three countries. 
And hopefully, as Professor Nishino also said, uh, uh, this year there could be trilateral summit uh, between the leaders from the three countries as well in this uh, very volatile and uncertain period of, of time. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for all your attention. Uh, and uh, please join me thanking all those uh, presenters and the discussant as well. <laughs>